What does YOLO stand for? You only live once. You only live once. To common, uh, you only live once. That's not misspelled. You scared me, Les. That's, that's spelled right. YOLO. You only live once. Now, those of you who knew YOLO, those of you who raised your hand that knew that it meant you only live once, why is that phrase used? Why is that phrase... Uh, I trusted you once. That was probably enough. Why is that phrase... Uh, why, why does somebody use that phrase today? What, what, for what purpose? It's an excuse to do something. An excuse to do something. Just anything? S- something stupid. Oh, something. <laughs> there, we get to the, there we get to the nitty-gritty. To, it's an excuse to do something stupid. It's not my word. Uh, That was from Mr. Brown. He's 16 years old. He's allowed to use that word. It's an excuse to do something stupid. It's an excuse. It is a slogan, a phrase. It's a philosophy. It It is a frame of mind that says, I can do whatever I want. I can do this activity. I can engage in this particular event. I can involve myself in, in maybe it's something stupid, maybe it's something dangerous, maybe it's something that's irresponsible, maybe it's something that is sinful. But if I say YOLO, if I say you only live once, then that is an excuse. That is a justification that says I only live once, you only live once, so we might as well, the older generation would say, you might as well live it up. And take the opportunity because you may not get this opportunity again. This morning I want us to spend some time coming to the Word of God. And using the Word of God to look at this myth of YOLO. To look at this myth of you only live once. And to see what the Word of God says about this philosophy of life. You see, this isn't a new philosophy. You know, YOLO is new because most of us have used words that were actually in the dictionary and didn't have to make them up. But YOLO is a new word, a new phrase to say you only live once. But that's not new, is it? Those of you who uh, have been around for any number of years, uh, hasn't that been a philosophy of life forever and ever? It goes back not just in this nation, goes back not just in the history of man. You can go back, and what I want us to do this morning is to go back and to look at a king of Israel who not only tried this philosophy once, he tried it twice. He not only followed this philosophy twice, it was three times, four times, he endeavored to use this philosophy to engage in and to pursue every activity of life that he possibly could. This morning what I want us to do is I want us to see what did he learn. The Bible says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 that those things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. That we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The question this morning is do we have anything to learn? The question this morning is, can we learn from what Scripture teaches us? And what I want you to do this morning is I want you to go to the passage that was read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the last verse of 2 Corinthians 4 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and put a marker over there. And then I want you to go over to the Old Testament and put a marker in the book of Ecclesiastes. And we are going to be looking at these two passages together this morning To try to decide what does the Bible say about YOLO. What does the Bible say about a philosophy of life that says you only live once. And what we are going to find is that scripture debunks this myth. To show us that this is not something we can use as an excuse to do something stupid. 
This is not something that we can use as a justification to do some activity because, well, you know, we're only going to be here once. We might as well live it up and try it all we can. But it's in fact a philosophy of life that will cost us our very soul. I want us to look at three things this morning. Three things that will help us to put this philosophy into context. To take this philosophy of life, no matter what our age is, and no matter how we phrase this certain philosophy, to take this, to put it in the context of the Bible, to understand how we need to view it. And the first thing that we need to see about this philosophy of you only live once, the first thing we need to see and to understand is that if we follow this philosophy of life, that we don't understand its failed precedent. Meaning this philosophy has failed in the past. Go to the book of Ecclesiastes. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we have an entire book of the Bible to show us that this philosophy of life fails. We have an entire book in the Bible, in the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon, the wise man Solomon, the wise man who the Bible says there was no other man on earth wiser than Solomon, Solomon who made it his endeavor to find satisfaction in life, no matter what the cost, no matter what was involved, to go and to find meaning in a life, to go and find purpose for his life. And as you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon tried it all. There was no stone that Solomon did not turn over. There was no excuse that Solomon did not try. There was no life activity that Solomon did not experiment with. And as you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, what we find is that Solomon's endeavors were all focused on earthly pleasures. And what he thought that this earth had to promise. One of the common phrases used throughout the book of Ecclesiastes is to talk about life under the sun. Some 27 times, Solomon uses that phrase to say, here's where I was looking. Here's where I was focused. I was looking at life under the sun. And I want you to look in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 as Solomon begins this book and understanding that all he wanted was to have a good time. All Solomon wanted to find was how he could have a good time. And he sits down and he writes this book. After he's tried all of his experiments, after he's gone down every one of life's paths, after he's used, well, you only live once, you might as well try it out as a philosophy of life. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 2, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Solomon says, I have tried it out. And this word vanity, he uses some 30 plus times in this book. And he says, everything I tried ended up being vain. Everything I tried under the sun ended up being empty. Everything I tried under the sun ended up not satisfying me. I was looking for satisfaction. I was looking for a good time and everything that I found that was offered under the sun did not supply what I thought it would do. Did not do for me what I thought it would do. As you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, and you look at these first several chapters, and we won't take time to look at these, but I want you to see some of the pursuits that Solomon followed after. And I want you to see as he writes the book of Ecclesiastes that the philosophy of YOLO, you only live once, Solomon used that. But it failed him every time. In his pursuit after worldly pursuits, YOLO failed him. In his pursuit after worldly philosophy or wisdom, it didn't work. In his pursuit after worldly power, the Bible says that Solomon became one of the greatest, strongest, most powerful rulers of all time, Solomon says, but it was all vanity. 
in his pursuit of worldly popularity. Solomon said, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Another phrase he uses is he says, it's like grasping at the wind. You ever tried to do that? You ever tried to grasp at the wind? How successful have you been? Could you grasp it? Could you hold it? Could you harness it? Could you pull it in? Solomon says, that's what it was like. When I was going after these things, it was just empty. Now come to chapter 2, and I want us to look at two of these things just briefly. Solomon as is the case with so many people today, pursued in everything that he could, worldly possessions. Look at what he says, Ecclesiastes 2, starting verse 4. He said, I made my works great. I, notice how many times he says, I and myself. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold And the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers. The delights of the sons of men. And musical instruments of all kind. So I became great. And excelled more than all who were before me. Look at the very last part of verse 11. And indeed all was vanity. And grasping for the wind. Solomon was the wealthiest man who ever lived. He had it all. But when he got near the end of his life, he said, I made it, I acquired it, I had it, but at the end of the day, it was meaningless. It was pointless. Life under the sun was absolutely empty. If we live by the philosophy that says you only live once, so I, I, I'm going I'm to gather all of the possessions that I can. You only live once, I'm going to make all the money I can. You only live once, I'm going to have the largest retirement nest egg that I can, that I can build. You only live once, so I am going to, to have all of the newest and latest gadgets, even if, it, even if it puts me in debt. You only live once, so I'm going to buy a new car. Even if I can't afford it, I'm going to buy a new car every year because I want the best, I want the finest, I want better than anybody else. And Solomon, who had it better than anybody else, tells us that this philosophy will fail. This philosophy, the following, you only live once, so gather all the possessions you can. It will not last. But not just with possessions. Look at the worldly pleasure that he pursued. Back up into verse 1 of chapter 2. Where Solomon says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you. And I'm not going to test you. Notice he he keeps trying these different experiments. These are experiments. These are tests to him. I will test you with mirth. That's not a word we use very much. I'm going to test you with, with gladness, with merriment, with happiness. Let's see how happy we can make ourselves. Let's see how happy I can make myself. Therefore, here's what I'm going to say to myself in verse 2. Enjoy pleasure. Let's find all of the pleasures that we can. But notice what he says at the end of verse 1, but surely this was also vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart, verse 3. I went looking. I went on a scouting mission, how to gratify my flesh. Solomon went about doing all that he could to fulfill his desires. There was not anything that he withheld from himself. He said, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guarding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. Drop down to verse 10. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. 
Not just possessions. <laughs> pleasures. Whatever I wanted, I got it. Whatever I wanted to do, I went and did it. Whatever pleasure I wanted fulfilled, I went and I had it. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked, verse 11, I looked on all the works that my hands had done. Remember those verses we read? I did this, I did this, I did this. Solomon says, after I did all of that, I looked back. Look at everything that I have done. And I looked on the labor of my toil. And here's what we saw. Indeed, all was vanity. And grasping for the wind, there was no profit under the sun. The more Solomon got, the more he realized that's not where life was. The more he enjoyed the pleasures and the lusts of life, the pleasures, the fleshly desires and carnalness of life, the more he realized that's not where it was. If we are going to examine what the Bible tells us about this philosophy of you only live once, you might as well live it up and go and get all that you can. Go and enjoy all that you can. Go and follow this philosophy of life where Solomon says, I searched how I might gratify my flesh. Brethren, we need to learn the failed precedent of everyone who has tried this before. That if we're going to follow the philosophy of life, that searches for gratification on this earth. We will either realize at some point in this life or we are going to realize in the next life that every bit of it is vanity. Every bit of it is empty. Every bit of it brings no satisfaction, meaningful, purposeful satisfaction to life. If we're going to learn anything from Solomon, need to learn this, this philosophy doesn't work. But not only do we need to see the failed precedent of this particular philosophy, we also need to see its flawed purpose. What was the purpose? The purpose of YOLO is an excuse to do something stupid. An excuse to go and do whatever I want. How does that sound for a purpose? How does that sound for a purpose of life and a purpose for activity? That, that, that that's going to be my purpose in life in order to justify what I want to do. I'm just, well, you only live once. In order to justify the, the things that I want to go and pursue in life, well, you only live once. You might as, you might as well go after it. You may, this, this opportunity may not come your way again. What purpose do you live by? Do you live by the purpose of life that says, I'm only going to live once. Therefore, I'm going to enjoy anything and everything that I can because I might not get it again. What is your purpose in life? When we turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, when we turn to that passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5, what we see is that there is only one purpose of life that will bring any meaning, that will bring any satisfaction to our hearts. There's only one purpose of life, and it's not the purpose of life that follows after everybody else is doing it. Well, if everybody else is doing it, then I'm going to try it too. It's the philosophy of life, it is the purpose of life that says, I am not going to be so focused on myself. Rather than being focused on myself, I am going to focus on God. You see, YOLO says, I only live once, so I'm just going to do what I want. But the real purpose of life looks beyond self. The real purpose of life looks beyond self. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Is this your purpose in life? Hold your finger in Ecclesiastes. We go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Can you say this is your 
purpose. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. Paul says, therefore, we make it our aim. Here's our purpose. Here's our determination in life. We make it our aim, whether present or absent. Our aim is to be pleasing to the Lord. What's your aim in life? What's your purpose in life? Would you say that your purpose today is to be pleasing to the Lord? Would you say that your purpose tomorrow is going to be pleasing to the Lord? Would you say that your purpose for life this week is to be pleasing to the Lord? Come back to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1. To that, to that generation that has been inundated with this YOLO philosophy, you only live once. Notice what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. Remember now your Creator when? In the days of your youth. Why? Don't remember Him when you're old? No. Remember Him in the days of your youth because there are days that are going to come that if you have not prepared yourself in your youth to remember your Creator, you're going to forget all about Him later on. If we live by the philosophy that says you only live once and not remember our Creator, the day is going to come where God is not a part of our lives if He ever was. Solomon gets to the end of this book. He gets to the end of his treatise to describe the failed precedent, the flawed purpose of saying you only live once. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, what does he say? Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. In other words, Solomon's saying, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. If you haven't understood some of the rest that I've talked about, don't worry about that. Focus on this. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is man's all. It's all that life is. Life is wrapped up in, do I fear God? Am I keeping His commandments? Life ought to be wrapped up in, my aim is to please the Lord. You see, if my aim is to please the Lord, I can't live by a philosophy that says, well, I'm only going to live once, so I'm going to go and do this. Because the philosophy of life needs to be, what does God want me to do? What would God approve of me doing? Looking beyond what I want and looking at what God wants. But the second part of our purpose in life is not just looking beyond self and looking to God, but it's looking beyond this life and looking to the next. Do you realize, do you realize that this life is not all that there is? Do you realize that the Bible says that there is something later on? And if all we are focused on is this life, we're going to miss out. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Bible says the things that we see are what? Do not look at the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary. If we're focused on this life, if we're focused on the things of this life, the Bible says those things, they're just temporary. They're not meant to last. They're not going to be here forever. So if we lay our treasures up in that which is temporary, what is going to happen to our treasures? They're just going to be temporary. But if I lay my treasures up in that which is permanent, in that which is eternal, what does that say about my treasures? Look in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Look in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 6, where God says, remember your Creator. Remember your Creator before you die. That's basically what the rest of the verse says. Uses that language about the golden bowl being broken and the pitcher shattered and the wheel being, uh, the wheel being broken and all of that is just talking about death. He says you better remember God before you die because what happens when you die in verse 7? The dust will return to the earth as it was. It's just temporary. This life, it's just temporary. But there is an eternal part of you, your spirit, that will return unto God who gave it. It doesn't matter 
It doesn't matter what kind of justification we try to give for certain ambitions in life. It doesn't matter what kind of justification we try to give for certain desires and fulfilling those desires in life. You only live once as a flawed purpose because it's not focused on the real purpose of life. And it misses the fact that at the end of the day, sin is still sin, even if I don't think it is. It misses the fact that being separated from God is still being separated from God. Even if I say, well, you only live once, it'll be okay. God will understand. God wants me to be happy, so if God wants me to be happy, He'll understand and it will be okay with Him. What's our purpose in life? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. God says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you? Can you take the temple of the Holy Spirit and engage it in activities by saying, well, you only live once, and take your temple of the Holy Spirit and go and do those things that would be contrary to what the Holy Spirit would want you to do? Don't you know, as a child of God, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you? He says in verse 20, don't you know you're not your own? You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit because they belong unto God. That's our purpose. It's to glorify God. That's not a flawed purpose. That's a perfect purpose by which we need to live. Very quickly, let me share this last point with you. If we live by the philosophy of YOLO, it's got a failed precedent. Everybody who's tried it before has failed. It doesn't work. It's got a flawed purpose. You try to live by this and, and your life misses the purpose of living. But you only live once. Also has a faulty premise. A faulty premise. You only live once. Is that true? Is it true that you only live once? Well, it might be true that you only live once on this earth. That part might be true. But do you only live once? As you begin to think about that as what is the premise of this statement that you only live once, our life on this earth, yes, there is just one life on this earth, but then there comes an end. At the end of this life on earth, our life will end, but is that the end? Is that the movie's over? The end. And, and everybody gets up and walks out and life is over. Is that what happens at death? Is death really the end? So do whatever you can before the end comes. Or is there anything that's going to take place after death? We've already seen that life on this earth is temporary. We've already seen that death is the end of life on this earth. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5, the Bible says the living know that they will die. Don't you know that you will die? We all know that we are going to die. We don't like to think about it. But every single one of us is going to die. Finish this verse with me. It is appointed unto man once to do what? To die. Now here's what I want from you. I just want the next word after die. It is appointed unto man once to die, but what? What's that next word? Once to die, but after. You all know that verse in Hebrews 9 verse 27? It's appointed unto man once to die. Now, if that was it, would there be anything after? If death was the end, would, why would the word after even be in the Bible? It's appointed unto man once to die. That's coming. But there is something that is going to happen after that. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. The Bible says to fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Look at the very last verse of the book of Ecclesiastes. 
For God will bring every work into judgment. Everything that I've done, God is going to bring into judgment. Did you hear that verse that Henry read this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 says, We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may receive on the day of judgment. Each one of us will receive what? What are we going to receive on the day of judgment? Somebody says, well, I'm going to receive a crown of life. What are we going to receive on the day of judgment? Well, I'm going to receive good news. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. What does this verse say? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. What does this verse say we are going to receive on the day of judgment? We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things that he's done in the body. Whatever I receive on the day of judgment is going to correspond with what I have done in the body. Whatever I have done in the body is going to correspond with what I receive on the day of judgment. So the way I'm living right now, the way I'm living right now is going to determine where I spend eternity. Well, what happens if I live according to the philosophy that says, well, you only live once. An excuse to go and do anything you want. You only live once, so just go and live however you want. If you live the one life you have to live on this earth, if you live it for self, let's just be blunt. If you only live once and you live for self, then you're only going to spend your eternity in one place. That's what the Bible says. But if you only live once on this earth and your philosophy of life is, I am going to live it for God. I'm going to live today for God. I'm going to live tomorrow for God. Well, what day are you going to live for yourself? I'm not going to live any day for myself. I'm going to live every day for God. When Jesus was on this earth, how many days did He live for you? Every single one of them. I'm going to live every day for God. And the Bible's promise is, when I live every day for God, that I will get to spend an eternity in heaven with our Maker. There's a lot that can be said about YOLO. There's a lot that can be said about finding purpose and meaning and satisfaction and joy and happiness in life. But true satisfaction... You want, what, you want what the Bible says? True meaning, true joy in life is not found in fleshly endeavors. It is found when we use our bodies to honor God. It is found when we don't focus on this life, when we focus on the next. It's found when we don't set our sights on this earth we set our eyes on things above. What's the philosophy of your life? Is the philosophy of your life, well, I'm only going to live once, so I'm going, to, I'm going to live it the very best I can and enjoy all the pleasures and all the possessions of life that I possibly can. Or is the philosophy of your life, well, I have to have a job, because the Bible says, if any man will not work, neither shall he eat. I've got to work. I've got to make a living. I've got to have money to buy food for my family and to put a, put a roof over our head. But I am going to live within. I am going to live within the scope in which God has placed me. And instead of focusing on the things of this life for me, I am going to focus on using those things for God. Some of you know exactly how to do that. Some of you are taking your 
skills, your life skills, and you're using them for the Lord. Oh, you're using them to make a living. But you take those accounting skills, aren't you glad April 15th is coming up? You take those accounting skills and you use them for the Lord to help others. You take your possessions, you use your home, not because your home belongs to you, but because you, your home belongs to God, and you use your home for God. You use your car for the Lord. What's your philosophy of life? Is it all about self? Or is it all about God? The Bible says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Are you ready for that? Are you ready right now to stand before Christ on the day of judgment? If Jesus were to return right now, and if everything you'd ever done was laid out on the day of judgment, are you ready right now? He could come right now. Are you ready for the day of judgment? Do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus is God's Son? You believe that with all of your heart? Then that kind of faith ought to cause you to want to turn away from sin, turn away from wrongdoing. That kind of faith, that kind of heart that says, I don't want to live for self anymore, I want to live for God, ought to cause you to say, I want to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. Not being ashamed of what I believe, but say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that? Are you willing to state that fact, that faith with your mouth? If you're ready to do that this morning, then you can do exactly what they did in the New Testament. You can be baptized for the remission of your sins. There's water here, garments here, everything's here and ready. The question is, are you ready? Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized, that's the person who will be saved. And once you're a child of God, God says, live every day. Live every day, not by the philosophy that says, what can I get out of this? Live every day by the philosophy that says, what can I give to God today? Can we help you at all this morning? Can we help you to get ready to meet the Lord? The song says there's a fountain free, and it's for everybody. All you've got to do is come and drink. Why don't you come as together we stand and sing?